each pew, just add your name and then pass it along to the next person. And guess, in addition to your names, if you are comfortable sharing your information, we do ask that you provide us with an email address, a phone number, maybe even a home address. That way we could follow up with you after the worship service. But again, we do welcome you here with us this morning. Um, a few announcements that I want to call to your attention. First of all, a reminder that it is Homecoming Harvest Day, which means we're not just here to gather in fellowship or, uh, or worship of our Lord, but also continue our fellowship after the service with some wonderful food and sharing around the table. So after the service, we do invite you to join us in the fellowship hall uh, after this worship service. I uh, also want to thank uh, Reverend Barnhill for being with us today to share the good news with us. We look forward to your message and are just delighted you're here with us this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now call your attention to the back of the bulletin for some opportunities to plug in with things that we have going on throughout the week. Um, and always we open our worship with a moment of silence. This is our time to reflect upon and remember exactly why that we've been gathered here today, and that is to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you will, join me in a moment of silence. Amen. If you will, please join me in the responsive reading from Psalm 84, found printed in your bulletins. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness.
Amen. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Holy and loving God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. We give you thanks for this building which we can worship you without fear, without persecution. God, we ask that you open our hearts and open our minds to hearing your holy word, to hearing a word of love, to hearing the gospel news of Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son, who we look to this morning. It is in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. please join me in the homecoming responsive reading found printed in your bulletins. A community of faith conveys God's good news of love and leads its members along pathways of faith. This congregation has been a vehicle of God's grace, shining God's marvelous light across the years. We celebrate the many members of this family of faith who have walked with the Lord through their years. We 
we celebrate the gift we are to one another as we learn and grow along this spiritual journey. It is a day of great joy in the life of this congregation as we celebrate the many lives it has already touched. In light of all God has given us through the gift of this community of faith, we joyfully give all of the glory to God. To be God be the glory. Great things he has done and continues to do. The offertory hymn is number 350. The church is one foundation. Please stand as we sing together. 350. Pray with me. Dear Lord, on this glorious fall day, we come to you in humility, knowing that the earth and all the blessings we have been given come from you. We come to you with confidence that you are with us as you have been with our church leaders and members over these many, many years. We come asking for your continued compassion and mercy as we seek to serve you and share your love with all peoples. Strengthen our faith that we may willingly give our money and ourselves to all those in our path who are in need. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. I'm going to sit with y'all today, okay? Can we get real close? Because I'm going to need some help with some things in this back. First off, I want to see if anybody can find a cross that's inside this church. Anyone look around, look behind you. Anyone?
Thank you, Wallis and children, for that beautiful message. Jesus wants to be in our homes. Amen? Amen. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord of bright and abiding light, you have shown us in the person of Jesus, your Son, a new way to live. You have poured your light into the world and have asked us to live in the light rather than run and hide in the darkness of doubt and despair. You promise to be our light all of our days and ask us to place our trust in you. The journey in this light is risky. It means that we will have to be very serious about our service to you giving you our best, and offering hope and light to others. This morning we bring to you the names and situations of others for whom light seems to be a stranger. They struggle with ill health, economic hardship, broken and damaged relationships, loss of loved ones, and anxiety. We place them in your care. Let your light shine on them, bringing healing and hope. Help us, dear God, to be bearers of that light in all that we do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, for allowing me to introduce my friend. I have known Andrew since he was born. His mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother were clients of mine in Wilmington, and we created a friendship from there. His mom, Mary Claire, and I have quite a bond which exceeds just friendship. It's more like adopted ties. (laughs) Enough said about that. Andrew (laughs) earned undergraduate, graduate, doctorate degrees from Furman University, Duke University Divinity School, and the University of North Carolina, respectively. He also completed um, postdoctoral training in management and in administration from Cornell University. Now, I could go on and on about Andrew and all of the many college degrees and all of his accolades, but I would be cutting into his time to speak. I will say that he has been involved in politics and a lot of preaching at a variety of churches, including interim for our own First Baptist Church in 2015. Andrew and my husband, Tommy, could talk politics forever. And Tommy had great big hopes that Andrew would pursue a career in politics. (laughs) He currently serves as the director of federal policies for Glasgow Smith Klein, which is one of the world's largest health care companies where he represents the company before the White House and other federal agencies. He is leading the company's executive engagement. Please make welcome Andrew Barnhill. It's hard to believe that 10 years ago, the piece that we're about to sing was written for us, our everlasting guide, was the words were written by a number of you uh, members of the church and a few friends we collaborated and it talks about our past then our present and then our future and there's a place in there for you to sing too if you will notice in the bulletin at the bottom of that section is our ho- our god and ages just past if you would like to follow in the hymnal with that one it's 74 in your hymnal be prepared to sing with us our god and ages past
Thank you, Eddie and choir. What a wonderful memory this morning. And thank you, Mary Alice, for opening it up so well with introduction that goes all the way back to the beginning of my life. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that this morning. Let's begin by diving directly into our scripture for this morning. I'd like to first take us to Psalm 119, actually the longest psalm in the Bible. And we will start at verse 142 to 144. Your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands are my delight. Your statutes are forever right. Give me understanding that I may live. And then in Paul's letter to the Philippians, Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Word of God for us, the people of God. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, use these words to your service to remind us that you're not yet done. Amen. I've always liked looking at real estate. When I was younger, I would scour the list of houses that were for sale, and I would decide the one that I I read about great architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, whose famous home known as Falling Water is a design legend. Before I discovered that communicating and advocating were more of my style, or more of my calling, you might add, I even had a drafting board where I would sketch out designs of houses and buildings. Then all these years later, when I moved into the house that used to belong to my great-grandparents, I put my energy into renovating it. And you're all welcome to come and take a look if you're ever in Wilmington for the day. But as most of you know, though, I spend most of my time now in the nation's capital. And over these past several months, after years of renting in Washington, I've begun the process of looking for a place to buy inside D.C., but for those of you that have ever heard about it, the Washington, D.C. housing market is notoriously difficult, not to mention expensive. Houses come and go pretty quickly, and the offers have to be pretty enticing. But one of the things that I've learned when people are house hunting, and this is true not just in D.C., but everywhere, is that people have a hard time imagining what could be when they walk into a house. My realtor friends tell me that when they show a property, they try to make it look as perfect as possible, even doing camera tricks to make rooms look more appealing to people who are visiting. But have you ever been inside a house that you know has lots of potential, but that will require time, that will require money, that will require attention to get it there? Have you ever been inside a church like that? A church, maybe, that's been around for a long time, that has been loved, that has thrived, but that sometimes needs a little care? I wonder if the church, meaning the Christian church, as a whole, is a little like that. And I wonder if days like this homecoming are ways of reminding us that every once in a while we need a reset. A reset to tell each other that God isn't done working in us. Today we entered and heard from the longest psalm of the Bible. And our particular passage focuses on the ongoing nature of God's promises. 
At verse 143, with the mention of trouble and distress. But it ends with a qualifier. Trouble and distress have come upon me, yes, but, but your commands give me delight. Happens again in the next verse. Your statutes are always righteous. Then give me understanding that I might live. There's a certain rhythm to the psalmist's message that for every challenge, for every distress, in God something is stirring. Perhaps delight, perhaps understanding, but something that I may live. Much like the eye of a storm whose strength is found in its ability to hold the chaos between the storm at the beginning, lots of rain and wind, and more at the end. The psalm offers a certain resonance and a certain lastingness to God's work in and for each of us. God isn't done because God gives understanding that we might live. I recently read a story that you might have come across as well been floating around a bit. It's about a woman who texted her father every day after he died on the number that used to belong to him. Day after day, she would send a message to this old phone. Well, this year, one day when she sent a text, she got a response. And for years, she had poured her life into these text that she was certain no one would ever read, no one would ever see. But every day, someone was reading those messages. A gentleman responded to her saying, you don't know me, but I've been reading your messages day after day, year after year. You see, I got this phone number a few years back, and they all started coming to me. At first, he said, I I just ignored the messages. But then last year, it all changed. He said, last year, my daughter died. She's about the same age as you. And the messages that I received from you about your life inspired me to keep going day upon day. God was working. Working through the most unlikely of text messages to minister to someone who needed it the most. God wasn't done. Just like God's not done with you, but maybe you think God is. Is there a part of your life that feels like stumbling blocks or ruins? Is there a part of your life where all you see is ashes? Where there once was a light? Maybe a missed opportunity along the way? Is there a part of your life where you're afraid to start over again? Maybe your health had you so down that you stopped trying to get around as much, but you'd love to give it another try? Is there a part of your life that keeps you up at night worrying? Worrying that you can't come up with a solution? So it must be the end? popular song by the Christian artist Taryn Wells, whose lyrics inspired those questions I just asked. Some of the words of the song go like this, standing in your ruins feels a lot like the end, so used to losing you're afraid to try again. Right now all you see are ashes where there once was a flame, but grace knows your name. Even with your broken heart and your wounds and your scars, there's a lot you don't notice until you're standing in the dark. Sometimes we all have to stand a little bit in the dark to see where the light could be. For a little more lighthearted example than our text messages, since I've lived in D.C. off and on since 2009, the Washington Nationals baseball team have always felt like a sort of home team for me. And I've gone to a couple of the games each season for much of the past decade. 
But for most of those years, it was pretty easy to get a ticket. You could actually buy them the day of for probably less than $10 most of the time. Um, you know, I could just walk right up and do it. But the, and this year actually started much the same way, which may surprise some of you that you could still do that a couple months ago. The Nationals began the season 1931, entered the playoffs with pretty low expectations. I think none of us would have expected what we've seen. Um, and they'd spent the past couple of October suffering pretty catastrophic defeats. It had been pretty bad. Even this season, they needed a very late-inning comeback to win the wild card game, if anybody saw that one. And some heroics, frankly, to win the division series. But the seeming impossibility of all of this led people to claim that the Nationals were some team of destiny, that there was something miraculous. But that's a little too easy to say. Rather, baseball just wasn't done with them yet. It's easy in a post-championship week like this to forget how this team came to be in the first place. Anybody know who the Washington Nationals used to be? Well, there's the Senators team in Washington, but this actual franchise was the Montreal Expos. Their owner, a guy named Jeff Luria, intentionally ran the franchise into the ground so that it could be moved. And he even arranged a deal such that Major League Baseball took ownership over the Expos. This was in 2005. And in 2005, the Expos moved to Washington and they became the Nationals. Only one player had been with them the entire time, and that was Ryan Zimmerman. He was drafted as the fourth overall pick that year. And let's face it, he and the team have weathered some pretty rough years. Those first couple of years, they were playing in an old stadium, known as the RFK Stadium, where even the, the sewage was backing up so much that they could barely use the facility. Year after year, they had 100-plus losses all the way up past 2010. So this story of how the Nationals got to where they were just a few months ago, to where they are now, can teach us some very important lessons. That just when we think we are done, when we think there is nothing left of us, God is often not done. The story of the people of Philippi is one where they had to learn pretty much the same thing. Our passage from Paul's letter today comes from the very first chapter. And in his letter to the Philippians, Paul's purpose is to try to show us how the gospel of grace should change us, should lead us into deeper partnerships with Christ. He wants the Philippian people to be so gripped by the good news that they are ready, as verse 27 says, to stand side by side with him for the cause of Christ. But let's be realistic. For much of their time, the Philippians thought that they were done. Let's remember who made up this early church. Philippi was a Roman colony a modest-sized town of about 10,000 people. We can sort of picture it. Um, there were a small number of people who were Latin speakers, Romans. And when Paul arrived there, as we hear in Acts, he found there were not enough Jewish men to establish a synagogue. And so he went outside of the city to the river where there was a place for prayer. And he found a couple of people when he began to preach and one woman named Lydia, who we may remember, had her heart open to the story of Jesus. And then Paul and Lydia began their journey walking along together, and they encounter a Greek young girl who was enslaved, part of the Philippian underclass at the time. She had been exploited and used economically, and eventually her owners started losing money 
because she was following around with Paul. And so what happened? Well, soon enough, Paul was put in prison. While in prison, he meets a Philippian jailer and takes him through the story of Jesus, eventually baptizing him. That's the story at Philippi. A wonderful picture of bringing around all types of people who otherwise would have nothing in common. When we come to our passage at verses 5 and 6, we find Paul talking with this group about how the community at Philippi has shared in the gospel together. He said, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is reminding his new gathering of followers who are nervous, who are afraid that God will continue good work through all the days. But why did this church need to be reminded that God wasn't finished with them? Well, let's keep in mind that this church was just starting, and no one knew at the time if it could carry on. Some thought it wouldn't last very long at all. It might have been done at the very first obstacle that it faced. Why do we need to be reminded? Well, much like Paul's church, sometimes we like to think that our church, the Christian church, isn't going to be around much longer. For years, the church has failed to speak prophetically to the issues of the day, and so now everything seems to be changing. The church is pushed further and further to the margins of society, and our normal ways of operating are challenged, are disrupted. But, but within that is the opportunity to create a newness, to refresh ways of thinking, To see what God is up to and find a way to be a part of it. But just as we find change within the church, we see how old ideas, old concepts, old businesses can be refreshed and brought into a new life. I've recently been reading a book that tells the story of a new business coming to life. The book is called The Battle for Uber, and it tells the stories of the early days of this company that has now skyrocketed to one of the most well-known and profitable in the U.S. Um, For those of you that have never heard of it, Uber is a company that's similar to a taxi cab service. You can call a car from your phone, and it comes to pick you up. But many of the drivers are everyday people many of whom have other jobs and they drive on the side. And in large cities like New York or Washington, Uber has become one of the main ways that people can get around because you can't drive and park all throughout the day. If you were to take a look at my bank statement, you would see a whole lot of Uber charges. But I mention this story because it's a good example of a group of people inside a company, in this case, taking a very old model that needed a refresh, and creating something new. All the ingredients were there. The cars, the drivers, the passengers. So what was missing? Well, much like those houses that we talked about earlier, it just needed a recharge. It needed a refresh. It needed a reminder that the story of the business wasn't yet done. A reminder that something new could be created. But I actually think there's another example that's going to feel much closer to home for you. I try to keep up with all the news from White Bull by talking to some of you, but also by seeing what's getting attention. And one of the things that I've been following pretty closely 
is the growth of your local newspaper. The News Reporter has always been a great paper that's been recognized for its coverage in this area, but it's faced a familiar challenge in the past number of years. Like many newspapers all across this country, it's had to figure out how to compete in an increasingly online world. Now, despite the few of us who you know, work in political-type jobs where we have to read newspapers every day, most people of my generation and younger generations don't read a daily newspaper. Where do people get their news? Almost entirely online, likely from their phones. And so, recognizing the need to do something different, the newspaper staff, including many people you know, including Jenny, set out to make some changes. The newsroom learned to test and experiment, to survey, to hold focus groups, to change the way subscriptions work, to change the calendar of its printing. But the lesson here is that the news reporter is not done changing yet. The ad department still plans to test different types of digital ads, I'm told, and it wants to find ways to monetize videos. The newsroom sees opportunities for new advertisers, and they are always going to keep changing and growing. First Baptist Church, maybe that's the case with you. Maybe feeling lost somewhere in the story of the church, you're beginning to wonder what is next. Maybe you're beginning to ask the hard questions about what happens when God seems far away. Maybe you're beginning to look through the lens of history and wonder why it's hard to tell what tomorrow looks like. Maybe it's the same thing in your own life. Maybe you just wake up some days and think, isn't this it? Maybe you go about your day and you wonder if God has given up on you. Maybe you look at your life seeking hope, seeking something new, and see nothing but crumbles. Maybe you feel like you've reached a point where you just can't find agreement with some people. Maybe you're in so much pain some days and you've been praying, but you still don't have answers. Maybe you've been hoping something would have changed by now, but it hasn't. Maybe you've cried all the faith you have through so many tears. Maybe you just don't know. If you've been watching the news out of California lately that's made the national news, you know that massive fires have erupted in Santa Paula and Southern California. A fire chief out there is quoted as saying, the end is not in sight. And as this fire threatens homes, power lines, and even citrus orchards, first responders and homeowners took to rooftops last week to try to beat back the walls of flames. When those who lost their homes were asked by interviewers what they grabbed on their way out, do you know what most of them said? Any idea? Photographs. Even now, 21st century America with so many pictures online, my photos. We may say that the past is dead, but that isn't true. The past is alive. We want to hold on to it to remind us where we've been. But sometimes, sometimes we need to look past the flames and see what is next to be. Can you see it? Can you see what's next for you? 
Can you look through the challenges of today and find God there changing, shaping, telling you that there is more? Maybe you can't see it. But God isn't done. God's not done with his church. God's not done with this church. And from the first day until now, God's not done with you. Not yet. Let's pray. Living God, may we be reminded today that we are your people. We are your people gathered home today to remember our stories of years past. But just as we are gathered today with a reminder of our history, may we also be called ever forward to what is to come. May our eyes be open to the ways that you are changing, that you are shaping us, and that you are offering new life in this place your church. All this we ask in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn of commitment today is hymn number 383. Will you join as we sing together, We Are God's People.
together. Um, may we remain standing for our benediction. May we go from this place as the people called to be the church, ever changing, ever growing, ever walking into greater service with you. Now go in peace.